On February 4, 1975, a group of Chinese researchers alerted the people of Haicheng, in the northeastern part of China, of the imminent possibility of a major earthquake. Exactly as they had predicted, a tremor measuring 7.3 raised the city just a few hours later. Fortunately, the authorities had been given enough time to evacuate most of the populace. The catastrophe killed 1,328 people, a relatively small percentage of the people living in that densely populated area. The system had worked. Yes, they did predict one earthquake. And the way that they predicted that earthquake, uh, they instrumented the area with many instruments around the area that they thought the earthquake would occur. And during the time that they had this uh, area instrumented, they could see many small earthquakes, and these earthquakes were increasing by some number, or so many tenths each day, each week, and they projected and said, if this would continue, we would have this large earthquake on this particular date. And they were able to say that this earthquake was going to be there because of the way the smaller earthquakes were increasing. And therefore, they could say, on this date, at this rate, we'll have the big earthquake. And they were able to predict that earthquake. But that was mostly precursor activity in the area. Since then, it has not been possible to predict any other earthquakes with the same precision. Countries such as the United States and Japan, which are particularly at risk, dedicate significant resources to studying seismological activity. Nevertheless, even though we could anticipate the occurrence of a deadly earthquake, the possibilities of mobilizing endangered population centers would still be relatively limited. Even if we are someday able to predict the fury of the forces of nature unleashed by the Earth in its ongoing mission of planetary transformation, it may be practically impossible to actually control them. Between 9 and 10 o'clock at night, the earth opened up near Timanfaya, about two leagues from Yaitha. On the first night, an enormous mountain rose up out of the ground, and from its highest point, flames shot up into the sky and continued to do so for 19 days. Those are the words of an eyewitness describing the volcanic eruptions that took place on the island of Lanzarote in the Canary Islands in the 18th century. They started on the 1st of September, 1730, and lasted until the 16th of April, 1736, over five years. More than a quarter of the island was affected by the disaster. The Canary Islands are volcanic in nature. Millions of years ago, volcanoes formed low-lying mountains in the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of northern Africa. They broke the surface of the water and, according to songs and popular lore, reached far into the sky. Over the course of tens of millions of years, volcanic activity has shaped these islands and formed these rather fantastic and somehow disturbing landscapes. The most recent volcanic event in the Canaries occurred in late 1971. It lasted 24 days. Many years have passed, but this area continues to be one of the most observed on the planet. All the volcanic activity in the Canary Islands is controlled from this center, the Geodynamic Laboratory in Lanzarote, one of the best equipped in the world. 
Predicting a volcanic eruption precisely when it occurs is practically the obligation of those of us who study volcanoes. A volcano, normally, or rather an eruption of the surface, entails enough premonitory phenomena to alert us to any process that might occur. Our problem is knowing how to identify said phenomena, which range from earthquakes or very characteristic tremors to equally characteristic terrain formations, or even changes in hyperthermal conditions in the area where an eruption might occur, or modifications in the release of volcanic gases, which are continuously spewing out of the fumaroles. Today, scientists have sophisticated equipment that allows them to detect volcanic eruptions months before they occur. To do so, the volcano must be under observation around the clock. Nevertheless, of the 2,000 active volcanoes in the world today, only 100 or so are subject to this kind of analysis. We tend to think of volcanoes as heralds of death and destruction. But actually, few other occurrences in nature prove even remotely as beneficial. Ash from volcanic eruptions fertilizes humid areas. Thermal waters are of great use in a wide range of therapeutic treatments. In fact, the intense volcanic activity that took place in the first stages of the Earth's formation gave rise to the atmosphere and the concomitant conditions required for life. Just like continental plates, oceans, volcanoes, and the atmosphere, living things also form an essential part of the machinery of planet Earth. We breathe the oxygen given off by plants. We eat products provided by specific species. We eliminate certain substances that are then used by other species as sustenance. We all need each other to survive. As humans, we add a few articles to the list of demands that the Earth takes the responsibility of providing. We find compounds in the forests and oceans to make medicines, to build houses, or make fibers with which we clothe ourselves. In just one day's time, mankind uses some 40,000 different species of living beings to satisfy his needs and many, many more to satisfy less vital desires. It should come as no surprise then that human activity, particularly since about 300 years ago, is the prime cause of the deterioration of the Earth's biodiversity. In short, we're abettors of a new kind of catastrophe. The disappearance of species is something that is inherent in the development of life on Earth. From the time the very first living organism appeared, some four billion years ago, over 50 billion different kinds of animals and plants have inhabited our planet. Some of them disappeared as a consequence of natural disasters or the very process of natural selection. Others evolved and came to form part of the biodiversity we see around us today. There are no precise studies, however, on the quantity of animal and plant species that currently live on Earth. While some scientists contend that there are more than 30 million, the fact remains that we have only cataloged approximately 1,750,000 of them. 
We don't know how many species there are on Earth, so it is very difficult to know how many become extinct. If you don't even know how many there are, you can't know how many you're losing, because what you don't know you're losing, well, you can't count on that as an asset. There are gross estimates, gross estimates that postulate that we're losing, say, at least somewhere between 1,000 or 2,000 and 5,000 species every year, and at most 50 or 60,000, since our society requires precise, round numbers, accurate figures. The scientific community tends to use a figure of 27,000 species, again, just a gross estimate. Now, these 27,000 species that become extinct every year would mean that in 1,000 years we would lose 27 million species. That is to say that in just 1,000 years, which is a very short time in a geological sense, practically all of the life forms on Earth today would disappear.